AP Biology, Chapter 42, Part 3. We left off Part 2 with a review of how the blood circulates throughout the mammal's body. We have two loops, two circuits. The first one's called the pulmonary circuit. That's the loop that goes out to the lungs to exchange gases. And the systemic circuit, which is pretty much everything else in the body. Now, these capillary beds have a lot of surface area, and that's structure that's related to their function of exchanging materials with the cells of your body. Now remember that the uh, fluid will leave the blood vessels, but not the cells themselves. They stay within the blood vessels because we have a closed circulatory system. We have the right side of the heart. Remember this is the patient's right, not your right. And uh, this is the oxygen poor blood, and you do need to know that. The left side of the heart is oxygen rich blood. And if you remember, you know, it's like if you're going through the systemic circuit, that's all the body cells, well, what are you going to be delivering to those body cells? Carbon dioxide or oxygen? What do you need for cell respiration? So if you know that the left side goes to the body, you also know that it's going to have oxygen-rich blood because there wouldn't be much of a uh, survival value of having oxygen-poor blood delivered to the cells of your body. So once again, we have right atrium, pulmonary artery, lungs, pulmonary vein, left atrium, left ventricle, aorta, capillary beds of the body. That's a lot of capillary beds. Vena cava, now we're going back to the heart, so they're veins. Right atrium, right ventricle. So let's see if you can answer some questions based on this. Let's see what you know. Pause at this time and try to answer this question. The right answer is the right ventricle. As you can see, the right ventricle will be pumping to the lungs. And you have to know these things. All right, next question. What comes off the left ventricle? Pause at this time and think about your answer. The left ventricle has the biggest artery in your body coming off of it called the aorta. The correct answer is D which returns blood to the left atrium. The left atrium is going to be receiving oxygen-rich blood from the lungs. Lungs refers to, uh, has a name called pulmonary. Since it's returning to the heart, it's a vein. Pulmonary vein is the right answer, C. which has blood with the most amount of CO2. These are some other questions that you should uh, be able to answer as well. The left atrium and the left ventricle is separated from the right side of the heart, and the left side is all oxygen rich. The right side is all oxygen poor or has the most amount of CO2. The correct answer is right ventricle. The aorta comes right off the left ventricle, and that's also going to have uh, oxygen-rich blood. The pulmonary vein is coming away from the lungs toward the heart, and that's going to be taking oxygen-rich blood back to the heart, as we can see in this picture here. Pulmonary vein, oxygen-rich. Left atrium, oxygen-rich. And left ventricle, oxygen-rich, as well as the aorta. All right, so we have our two um, circuits, and you need, need to know that. There's two circuits, a pulmonary that goes to the lungs, systemic that goes to the body. Write this down. Uh, Four-chambered heart, that's in mammals and birds, focusing on mammals. We have two atria. Those are the thinner-walled muscles up here of cardiac muscle to two ventricles, very thick. And you can kind of understand why. The atria are only really pumping really a short distance. They're just pumping into the ventricles. They're almost like just a holding area. The um, ventricles have a much thicker wall, and especially the left ventricle, look at how thick that wall is. But, you know, consider what it's doing. It's got to pump that blood to all the cells of your body, and that uh, cardiac muscle never gets a break. Veins carry blood to the heart, arteries away from the heart. Easy way to remember that. Artery starts with an A, away starts with an A. So that's how I remember it. The ventricles pump almost in unison. All right. Now there's two more things I want to talk about with the heart here, and they're the valves. We have one valve here that separates the atria from the ventricle on both sides. Atria, ventricle. And we have a name for that valve that prevents the backflow of blood back into atria. This valve here, which prevents backflow, is called the atrioventricular valve, or AV valve. And that one's pretty easy to remember as far as what it does, because atrio 
ventricular. It's between the atrium and the ventricle. So that's, that's a pretty easy one. The other one's a little more difficult. This one's called semilunar. It looks like a uh, half moon, um, apparently. Semilunar valves are the ones that uh, prevent backflow of blood from the arteries back into the ventricle. So semilunar, semilunar prevents backflow into the ventricle. Atrioventricular prevents backflow of blood into the atria. Bypass surgery, uh, when those arteries that feed the heart get plugged up with uh, plaque and other deposits, uh, you starve the heart of oxygen and glucose, and that heart is constantly beating and needs a constant supply of energy. So if it's starved long enough, the tissue starts to die in the heart, and that would, is what basically a heart attack is all about. So when people have clogged arteries, what they do is they take a piece of vein from their leg, typically, and then they graft it and then bypass the blocked artery. So here we have a bypass surgery where they're bypassing blocked arteries. It's, a, it's uh, very difficult to actually do anything with the arteries that are actually blocked on the heart. If you have two bypasses, that's called double bypass, and if you have to bypass three arteries on the heart, coronary arteries, that's called a triple bypass surgery. All right, let's go and write this down. Atrioventricular valve prevents backflow of blood back into the atria. The semilunar valves prevent backflow of blood back into the ventricle. Kind of keeps everything going in the forward direction. You want the blood that's oxygen poor going to the lungs and nowhere else to pick up some more oxygen. Even though this has ventricle in the name, this valve prevents backflow into the atria, not the ventricle, AV valve. The correct answer was semilunar valve. All right, cardiac cycle, some more things we need to write down. The contraction phase of the heart pump and blood is called the systole, and that's when the ventricles are actively pumping the blood out. This is where the, there's a big push from this cardiac muscle. The relaxation phase is called the diastole, and that's when the atria are refilling with blood at the top here. So systole, diastole, two words you should know, contraction and relaxation phase. You know, the bump, 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 bump. Um, that actual noise actually is caused by something that we'll talk about in a second, but uh, you do need to know the systole and diastole. So let's go through this uh, really quickly. Nothing that you need to write down for this, just kind of explaining what's going on when the heart beats. We have uh, at the top here, or let's start over here, the atrial and ventricular diastole where the chambers are filling up. We have both the ventricles and the atria filling up with blood. The valves are open for the AV valves, but not the semilunar, so we can't get any blood out of the heart at this point. Then the atrial stroke is when just the atria contract and squeeze the blood into the ventricles. So the ventricles are filling up with blood. And then during the uh, second part of uh, heartbeat, we have a, um, the ventricles contracting. This is going to be the big push that's going to push the blood through the semilunar valves and into the arteries to either the lungs on the right-hand side or the rest of the body on the left-hand side. And we can measure some of this stuff. We use um, the cuffs that uh, the blood pressure uh, sensors. Here we have um, the first number, which is the systole, or the act of pumping of the heart. And the typical range is about 120. So that is something that you will uh, eventually need to know. Yeah, I think you should write that down. 120 over 70 is normal blood pressure. I'll say that again. One, 120 over 70 is normal blood pressure. And there it is right there. The 120 is the systole, or when the ventricles are pumping. The second number is the diastole, when there is no active push from the heart. So both the numbers are kind of important. If uh, the numbers are high, that's kind of generally considered bad, because if you're out of shape, your heart has to pump harder to, it's not as efficient, so your heart pumps harder, and that increases the blood pressure. You're like making a, a bigger push, uh, which is kind of uh, a, a sign of a less efficient heart in a way. Also, if there's a lot of arteries plugged, plugged up, the blood has trouble moving through it, and that also can increase blood pressure. Now, ultimately, blood pressure could result in burst arteries and uh, blocked arteries and things like that that could be a real issue. So that's why you try to monitor your blood pressure. You could have too low of blood pressure. If you don't have enough push from the heart, uh, then you can't even circulate blood 
uh, efficiently throughout your body. So extremely low blood pressure is also a problem and sometimes happens in cases of uh, shock. Now, we're not talking electric shock, but blood loss shock. The blood pressure goes down way, way low when there's too much blood loss. The 70 even uh, represents the relaxation phase of the heart. So we're talking about the, um, the heart filling up with blood, but there's still a little bit of uh, pressure within the, the arteries. We measure the arteries uh, and not the veins. The veins, the, uh, the blood is moving much slower. All right, so what is that lub-dub sound in your heart? Well, the lub is the slap of the blood against the AV valves as they close. So you have the blood squeezed into the, uh, the ventricle and then slaps against the, oops, slaps against the AV valve and makes the lub sound. And then once the uh, ventricles uh, contract, the blood leaves the ventricles and then slaps against the semilunar valve. So that's slapping of blood against the uh, semilunar valves and AV valves gives you that lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up. A heart murmur is when you have a improperly closed valve and um, if the valve doesn't close all the way, there is a little blood that leaks back into the previous chamber, whether it's uh, through this valve or this valve, it could be either one. And uh, it makes like a hissing noise when that blood leaks through. And that's what's called a heart murmur. As you can imagine, someone with a heart murmur doesn't push all the blood quite as efficiently as someone without it, so they're not going to be able to circulate fluid uh, like glucose with glucose and oxygen in it as well, and that could lead to some tiredness and fatigue. All right, arteries, you should know this, thick middle and outer layers. There's a thicker wall that provides strength for high blood pressure or pumping of blood. Uh, here's an artery here. If arteries were thinner, there would be less of a selective pressure for it because uh, they would keep on bursting, killing the animal that had those weaker arteries. They're also a little bit elastic, so they're kind of a little kind of rubbery if you want to think of it like that. So they can stretch a little bit. That's arteries away from the heart. Veins are thinner walled than arteries, uh, and you do need to know this too. You might want to write this down. Blood travels back to the heart at low velocity and pressure. You have to know that Arteries have much higher pressure than veins, and veins have higher pressure than capillaries. Blood flows uh, due to skeletal muscle contractions when we move. So even though the blood is being pushed by the heart, every time you flex your muscles, and here we have a pair of muscles, you can imagine that like the biceps and the triceps, um, when the muscles squeeze, they push on these uh, veins. And there's a whole bunch of one-way valves in these veins, so when they squeeze it forward, the blood forward, the blood can't go backwards because of these one-way valves. So just by moving and uh, exercising, you assist the forward flow of blood in your veins. Capillaries are the thinnest walled, and um, they also have the um, slowest uh, movement of blood. This is uh, the function for those thin wall structures on capillaries is to allow stuff to leave the blood. Now, not the red blood cells, but the things like the fluid uh, that contains glucose and oxygen and amino acids are going to leave at the capillaries. And you have capillary beds everywhere. In fact, when you blush, it's really just capillary beds opening up and allowing blood in that gives you that blush. Also, when you cut yourself and you can't see where you're cutting yourself from, those are the capillaries you're cutting. So they're very tiny blood vessels. You would need a microscope really to see them well. And uh, they're the thinnest walled area of exchange for, um, for getting stuff to your cells. All right, capillary beds. At any given time, only about 5 to 10% of the body's capillaries have blood flowing through them. You don't have to know that. Capillaries in the brain, heart, kidneys usually fill the capacity, and other sites, blood supply varied uh, as needed. So we have these little sphincters, little uh, uh, muscle uh, areas that can open and close, form like little valves, so you can open them up and let more blood through, or close them up and let less blood through. When you overheat, you open up more uh, capillary beds to dissipate more heat, more surface area, because blood carries the heat, and uh, that cools you down. And that's why sometimes you get flushed when you're uh, overheating. When you're freezing, you try to conserve that heat, especially in your extremities, like your arms and legs. So when you close off those capillary beds to conserve heat, conserve it for your core areas, uh, it might make you look a little bit uh, pale as a result of cold weather. 
All right, this gets a little more complicated, uh, but you do have to know what's going on here. So this is the side of the capillary closest to the heart. This is the side closest to the arteries. This part of the capillary is closest to the veins, and this is the site of exchange. So how does fluid leave the, the capillaries and enter the interstitial fluid that surrounds the cells of your body? We're going to talk about that now. It depends on two things, and we should write this down, blood pressure and osmotic pressure. And you have to know what happens on the artery side of the capillary as well as on the vein side of the capillary. On the artery side of the capillary, as you can imagine, there's still a lot of push from the heart, and that's going to increase a lot of blood pressure, that push. So the blood pressure uh, is fairly high on the artery side of the capillary. The other factor affecting the movement of fluid between the um, capillaries and the interstitial fluid is osmotic pressure. Now, osmotic pressure just re refers to osmosis, and uh, osmosis is going from high to low concentration. The water here is more pure or hypotonic compared to the water inside your uh, capillaries. So the natural tendency for water is to move from where it's more pure, interstitial fluid, to into the capillaries. So we got osmosis in this direction, and the blood pressure is pushing the fluid out in this direction. Now on the artery side, blood pressure is greater than osmotic pressure, and you should write this down with a quick sketch. I wouldn't draw all this, but uh, you do need to know that on the artery side, blood pressure greater than osmotic pressure and understand what that means. Now see the red blood cells staying inside the capillaries, they don't leave. So that's how we get the fluid out of our capillaries. And inside that fluid is all the stuff the cell needs, amino acids, glucose, oxygen. And then to get inside the cells themselves, we rely on diffusion, facilitated diffusion and active transport. Diffusion of oxygen, facilitated diffusion of glucose, and active transport of ions. Now there's some waste products like carbon dioxide and um, ammonia that uh, the cells are going to get rid of. And on this side of the capillary, the side closest to the veins, the blood pressure is much less. It's a uh, very low blood pressure. You're far away from the heart. So what ends up happening is osmotic pressure or osmosis is greater than blood pressure. So the fluid with the carbon dioxide now, as well as uh, waste products, goes back into your capillaries. And now you can take all the nastiness from your cells to the excretory system or the lungs to get rid of it. Carbon dioxide will be gotten rid of at the lungs via the pulmonary circuit, and the uh, uh, urea that will be formed from ammonia will be gotten rid of from the kidneys. So take a minute to try to understand what's going on here. Artery side of the capillary, blood pressure greater than osmotic pressure, pushes the fluid out, gets the good stuff to the cells. Vein side of the capillary, further away from the heart, less blood pressure, osmotic pressure is greater, fluid with carbon dioxide and other stuff from waste products flows back into the delivery uh, or the tubes of your body and uh, the capillaries now can take that back to the veins, back to the heart and to various locations to get rid of those waste products. This ends part three of your notes on chapter 42.